Okay, so thanks a lot everyone for joining us for the first installment of this technology and mobilities in Africa seminar series. So um, this is a continuation of the ICT 4D seminars that we have been running here um, for a couple of years and perhaps some of you have already attended in the past. Um, I'm Sanna Oyantera and I work as a researcher and DPhil student here at the OII. And this seminar series is organized in collaboration with Mark Graham, who is the professor of um, Internet Geography here, Fabian Bresemann, who is a data scientist here, and then two of our colleagues from the Department of International Development and the International Migration Institute, um, Gunvor Johnson and Marie Gooding. And before introducing our speaker today, um, I just wanted to say a few words about the seminar series and kind of a couple of practical considerations. Um, so in the past seminars, we have encouraged these discussions to kind of continue and expand on the Twitter, just because we want to engage with people that might not be able to be here in the room today. So if you want to share any reflections or your thoughts during the seminar or after, um, please use that hashtag that's on the board there, um, OxICT4D, which is our event hashtag that we have been used for these seminars for, for years. And also the event is, is being filmed and will be shared later on, so please just keep all noise to a minimum during the presentation so we have a very clear voice quality. And so with that, I think we're all ready to hear more about our presenter, um, Dr. Elspeth Robson. Um, she's a senior lecturer in human geography at the University of Hull. Um, her research and teaching interests include social inequality, ethics and social justice, uh, in particular with respect to women or children or youth. Um, and geographically, her research concentrates in sub-Saharan Africa. And Elspeth has also managed um, large components of multi-country ESRC um, DFID research grants in Malawi, which address young people, transport, mobility, and mobile phones. And her current research in Africa includes projects on cash transfers, um, community health workers, and mobile phones. And today Elspeth is going to talk about social media, children, and young people in Malawi and about digital devices, and with that I'll hand over to Elspeth. Thank you very much, Sana. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's nice to be back in Oxford where I did my DPhil <laughs> quite a few years ago. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about crossing digital divides, social media, children, and young people in Malawi, Africa. And because there's just quite a small number of us here, it would be really helpful for me if we could just really quickly just go around the table and just briefly tell me who you are, student, lecturer, what you're interested in, so I have kind of know who my audience is, if, if you don't mind. No. So you just heard about me. <laughs> um, my name is Rebecca Dowd. I'm a visiting doctoral candidate from the United States at Georgia State University. My dissertation research that I'm here working on looks at internet governance. Lovely. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, my name is Juliano Spayev. I finished my PhD uh, last year at UCL Anthropology. Um, my field work was, um, took 15 months in a low income, pop, you know, low income settlement in Brazil, and I studied the uses and understandings of social media. Thank you. Uh, I'm David Zeitland, I'm a social anthropologist. My research is mainly based in Cameroon, um, but I have friends in the valley. <laughs> Great, <laughs> thank you. I'm Kelly, I'm a master's student here at the OII, um, and I'm focusing many of my classes on uh, technology and developing contexts, uh, particularly with healthcare. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Martin Dittus. I'm a, a postdoc here at the OII. I'm a researcher in uh, social computing and a data science. My name is Ruthie from Malawi. I'm an MSc student in visual material and museum anthropology. And yeah, I'm interested in photography practices and social media use. Okay, lovely. Uh, my name is Tessa Dainaker. I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham in African Studies and Anthropology, and I study technology entrepreneurship in Accra, Ghana. Great. 
I'm Kate Maher. I'm a, an associate professor at the London School of Economics, and I specialize in African informal economies. We just recently finished a report on the informal economy and ICTs. Hi, I'm Valentia Matereda. I'm a master's uh, student of the African Studies Department, and my research is focused on the limitations and possibilities of social media as a feminist tool for expressing academic freedom in Uganda. Yeah, I already said a little bit about myself in the beginning, <coughs> but just for you, um, I work as a researcher and a DPhil student here. Um, my name is Sana, and I'm looking at um, informal economies on online labor platforms. Lovely, that's great. So we've got a really interesting audience here and diverse kind of takes on social media and Africa, anthropology, different disciplines. So it'd be great. I'm sure we can have some interesting discussion um, as we go through. Um, so just to, to kick off then, I'd just like to say that I'm presenting this seminar on behalf of a, a, a large research team. This is part of a multi-country study and you don't just do that on your own. You work with other people. So G Professor Gina Porter is the PI on this project at Durham University and we've worked with other colleagues in anthropology, Kate um, Hampshire and then in Malawi Dr Alistair Muntali and the late James Milner to whom we dedicate um, this seminar. He died in a road accident in the late stages of field work but was very integral in data collection and as well as James and the other academic members of the team would just like to acknowledge all the many research assistants who help with the data collection and data processing um, some of whom are in the photograph here. Um, as an overview, um, this, uh, and I'll come to the overview later actually, um, I think it fits in better a little bit, but just an outline then, what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about the context, um, some of which will be very familiar to people here in the audience, social media and use of social media through mobile phones um, in sub-Saharan Africa and Malawi in particular. Then I'll spend a bit of time talking about our research, the locations and the methods that we use for our data collection and analysis. Then focus um, on social media use, which is a very small component of a big multi-country study with lots of different angles. And I brought some of our published papers along for people who are interested afterwards. And then some kind of tentative conclusions about the opportunities that social media offers on the kind of transformative side of kind of crossing digital divides versus the kind of potential for harm and so on. Okay. So, um, a bit of context then. So, as we all are aware, recent decades we've seen a very dramatic communications revolution going on globally. The growth of the internet, adoption of mobile phones, things like mobile money and PESA in East Africa. More recently, smartphones and their new capabilities for social networking via various internet forms of communication, apps and messaging platforms. Within Sub-Saharan Africa, there have been arguments that this rapid uptake and adoption of this new technology, particularly through mobile phones, especially now smartphones more recently, and the possibilities for sharing content and, and creating content, has been stimulating economic growth and contributing to the so-called African Renaissance. It's very easy to read assertions that are made about the economic, social and political development potential of this rapidly evolving technology, claims that mobile phones can lift many out of poverty by offering new life opportunities, or claims from things like The Economist magazine that there's this transformative potential of new technologies that in low-income economies an additional 10 mobile phones per 100 population increases the per capita GDP growth by more than 1%. So there are lots of these kind of big, wonderful kind of statements out there. And it's very true that the use and the ownership of mobile phones in general, and particularly among children and young people, which is our focus, has expanded exponentially, both in rural and urban locales across Africa. And um, that's very well um, documented. And including in some quite socially and spatially marginalized um, groups, including rural pastoralists, for example. And this has happened a lot faster than the uptake of other forms of information and communications technology. So internet use has been much slower. Uh, fixed line telephones is actually now falling um, in Africa. And there are several reasons for this. So cell phone coverage has um, rapidly rolled out. The technology has been rapidly rolled out by, by private companies, not by um, development interventions or international aid and so on by private companies. 
Mobile phones have become a lot cheaper. Cheap second-hand um, devices coming from China in particular. And the fact that you don't need much in the way of literacy skills for basic usage of mobile phones. And in a lot of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, it's very informal. You don't need to register your SIM card. You can just buy and sell as you want to a SIM card. You can buy airtime and data in very small uh, amounts. So there's been not so much formal registration. You don't have to sign up to packages and contracts and so on in a lot of places. And the cell phone companies have been very, very successful. They've done a lot of innovative marketing and service delivery, and they've tailored it to a very distinctly African market from the early stages in the Africa's mobile phone revolution. So we have the kind of success of Celtel, which became Airtel, which then changed its name and has kind of had various iterations. So for um, everyday folk in Africa, you don't need a subscription package. Airtime is available in small units at low costs. African governments have been quick to liberalize the wireless communications networks. They've granted licenses within the cell phone sector. In some countries, there's lots of companies competing, and in other countries, there's just one or two. So what does this mean for young people? Well, it means that for young people, just like their more privileged uh, contemporaries in the global north, smartphones have quickly become the latest must-have accessory for African city youth. Although uptake is very differentiated across several digital divides, and that's what we're interested in, these digital divides. So the transformative potential then of this technology, and in particular social media use, for the lives of children and young people is potentially very exciting. The outcomes are evolving. It's something that's moving very rapidly. At the moment, it's uncertain and not very well documented. However, there is some work. So social scientists like um, Miriam de Bruun and her colleagues um, at Leiden University have begun to examine how in African societies this new technology of, of mobile telephony is shaping or reshaping social realities and how Africans across the continent in various ways are appropriating, innovating with and socially shaping this new digital technology. To date, there's not been many people who've looked at the practices of young people. Here and there, there are studies. So people have looked at students text messaging in the University of Khartoum, or people, young, young people and children operating mobile call services, um, explorations of mobile phones and intergenerational, intergenerational relationships in, in Sudan and so on. So our paper then um, derives from um, an interdisciplinary research study which focuses particularly on children and young people's mobile phone use across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and so we had in this larger study aims to look at the transformative potential of mobile phones for children's life chances, to look at strategies for promoting positive use of mobile phone adoption, including social media, and at the same time to minimise any potential negative impacts. So this is work that we conducted on the basis of an earlier study that looked at children's mobility and movement. And so we had some baseline data from an earlier study. We engaged with stakeholders throughout both studies through country consultative groups, so in, in government ministries, in schools, in child-focused NGOs, um, and so on. And we worked with um, young people as young researchers, so it was, some of it was a peer-to-peer -peer element of research. And it was a multi-methods qualitative and quantitative um, research. So what we're trying to do in this uh, piece of work was respond to the lack of qualitative ethnographic work um, in sub-Saharan Africa on children's use of mobile phones. We were responding to earlier calls for further study of ICT usage patterns and out outcomes and more recent encouragement to people, particularly in academia, to look at the relationship between technologies, people and spaces. So people have called for more research on the mobile phone in Africa, especially in terms of generation. And the focus in this paper then is to look at the politics of space and society embedded in what we call digital divides, or that's a, a concept that we do critique in the paper. Um, digital divides that inhere in children and young people's use of social media on mobile phones in Africa and therefore we're extending earlier work that's been done on socio-spatial connections in what we can describe as communication technoscapes and responding to arguments um, particularly um, from Professor Mark Graham, um, who your Professor of Internet Geography, who's put forward that it says we should pluralise, localise and ground digital um, divides. So that's kind of what we're trying to respond to that agenda here. So um, 
we know that there is this massive ICT revolution going on globally. Um, uh, we're all part of that as well across Africa and other developing countries and the global south like India. And within that, there have been concerns raised about the social and geographical digital divides between what we might call broadly the haves, the people who are engaging and have access to it, and the have-nots, the people on the wrong side of the digital divide. Generally, the pattern is that if you're poorer, less educated, older, and in a rural area in the global south, you're less likely to have access to and to use all forms of ICT, including social media, in comparison with people who are wealthier, more urban, more educated, um, what we might call it the young elites in their own countries and also in the global north. So we've had this discourse about um, digital natives, young people growing up at home with all this technology and older people not being at home with it. Um, but there are quite a few studies going back, you know, a decade or more, early studies that suggested that mobile phones were a technology or are a technology of inequality and that there is more rapid uptake among those who are already better off um, back in 2003, the United Nations World Summit on the Information Society addressed the global digital divide and recognised the risks that those without access to ICT would be left further behind, further marginalised, and they highlighted the need to empower young people, women, the poor, and populations in less developed countries, especially remote and rural areas, to ensure universal, ubiquitous, equitable and affordable access to ICT infrastructure and services. All well and good and laudable as, as an aim. Thirteen years later, the World Bank in its flagship World Development Report of 2016 on digital dividends, they raised similar concerns that despite in the intervening years there being rapid global spread of digital technologies, the development benefits of using these new ICTs have been very uneven persistently lower levels of connectivity for women, minorities, rural populations, people with less income and poorer education levels. So we've seen these, these digital divides kind of reproducing over, over several decades. And the World Bank has called for closing the digital divide, especially with respect to internet access. And here they echo several of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in 2016, specifically with respect to innovation and infrastructure, and the Sustainable Development Goal 9 has a key target to significantly increase access to information and communications technology and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developed countries by 2020. Thus, digital divides, global, regional, national community levels are highly geographical landscapes of spatial and social inequality produced and reproduced by the uneven provision and adoption of new technologies. And these are overlaying on existing axes and landscapes of geographical, economic, political and social spatial inequalities. In other words, the cartographies of digital divides map onto other kinds of social and spatial inequalities with contradictory effects. Therein lie the economic development and social justice imperatives to close the gaps between the digital haves and the have-nots. And a huge amount of effort and money have been directed and are still being directed towards reducing the digital divide, echoing what the World Bank and the Sustainable Development Goals are trying to achieve. So our paper sets out to interrogate digital divides among young populations in Africa with res specific respect to their use of social media. So there's several things that this paper is not. So this paper is not about you new social media gurus or professional social media elite bloggers who have emerged in Africa and elsewhere in recent years and they have huge groups of online followers and they're people who are doing research on the metrics of kind of tweets and retweets and, and, and so on. We're also not looking in this paper about how a project has ha tried to introduce a new E or M technology into a resource poor setting in the global south to achieve development. There are plenty of studies of those and also plenty of failed examples of those. Neither is it a study of the use of ICTs, including social media, in response to humanitarian disasters, which is another area of research. Rather, what we're doing is trying to critically explore how ordinary, everyday children and young people are accessing or not accessing social media via the relatively new technology of internet-enabled mobile phones in the context of ordinary, everyday imperatives to meet their own personal needs and those of their families and communities. So having set out some of the parameters then of the African social media context within the global digital revolution and the worldwide adoption of the smartphone, 
And this paper goes on to detail the locations and methods of our empirical research that underpin this examination of the power relations embedded within these socio-spatial digital divides being played out across the global south. So by mapping across geographical space and social demographics, the varied practices, the usage and non-usage and lack of access as well as access to social media for children and young people in Malawi, we're looking at these kind of social justice imperatives of research. And in conclusion, we try to question the opportunities for transformation and empowerment on the one hand that social media offers and juxtapose this against possibilities for harm. So a little bit then about our um, methods. So we uh, draw on original data here, gathered by this interdisciplinary team. I've mentioned some of the, the colleagues in the team when we're geographers, anthropologists, sociologists and economists in a three-country comparative study of mobile phone use by children and young people in Malawi, Ghana and South Africa. Um, I don't know why there's blue text on top of that. It should just be a plain map. Um, it is a plain map, a plain map. Yeah, on that one. It's less. Yeah, I think it's a shadow. Um, so you can see the three countries there. Um, and this builds on an earlier study of children's mobility uh, undertaken largely with the same team. And in all three countries, we collected data from young people aged 9 to 24 years and adult key informants in eight field sites in each country. So that's 24 field sites uh, in all across a spatial continuum from urban areas, peri-urban sites, rural villages to small remote rural hamlets. In Malawi, the study was conducted in uh, the southern region in Blantyre district and the central region in the Longway district with four field sites in each district. Okay. So um, I think we can see then um, that these are the kinds of field sites that, that were involved. Um, so the remote rural field sites in relation to mobile phones had very little network coverage, if any, very little access to electricity. Although during the period we were doing the research, we saw more solar panels uh, coming into play and uh, more people um, being able to charge their mobile phones, even if network coverage wasn't improved. At the other extreme, in the cities, you've got fantastic mobile phone coverage, access to relatively reliable electricity um, and other services as well. So a kind of geographical uh, continuum then. Um, and this means that we have some strengths in this data set. We've got longitudinal data because, remember, we did the mobility study in 2006, so we have some baseline data. Um, and then we did the mobile phone study in 2013-14. So it's multi-country, it's multi-site, it's mixed methods, it's a very big data set. And we can look at change across eight years or so. And we basically found, obviously, not surprisingly, that households in our, in our surveys um, went from, in Malawi, less than a quarter of households having a mobile phone to um, over two-thirds of households having a mobile phone within that period. Um, and that has uh, continued to increase um, since then. So um, for the mobile phone study, we did a questionnaire survey with 1,500 children in each site um, and also qualitative data collection from children and young people looking at particular themes and stories of mobile phone use, whether that was uh, using mobile phone in education, in religion, for livelihoods, um, and also call register interviews, where we asked young people who had a mobile phone to take us through their call register. So yesterday, who did you call? How many text messages did you send? What were they about? How many calls did you receive? And so on, where they were willing to disclose that private um, information, what we call call register interviews. And key inform in interviews with um, parents, teachers, health workers, people running phone related businesses and life stories with people who are a little bit older than our age group, so those in their 30s and 40s talking about kind of having mobile phones. We did focus groups as well with young people and adults and children were in school and out of school young people um, and older people as well. We collected essays from school children and all our field researchers were asked to uh, record their own observations in the field as well. And then at the same time, at national and regional level, the service providers um, uh, on the mobile phone providers, um, we had some interviews with them, and the country consultative group meetings were also minuted and recorded. So it's a huge, huge data set, um, a very big data set, um, and very varied. Um, so from that, um, we can say that this is a kind of cross-national interdisciplinary, longitudinal, ethnographic, qualitative, quantitative research on ICT.
community. And this is a research that has been called for by, by various scholars. And our contribution here is really trying to improve understandings in how technology is used and what are the roles of ICT in human social development. And here in this paper, by looking in particular at the production and the reproduction of social and spatial inequalities in using social media via mobile phones for children and young people in a particular African setting. Um, so for this paper, from that huge data set, we look at just the questions in the survey on social media use, which were just a small subset of questions. We look at the call register interviews and the focus group discussions, because um, that's where most of the data is relating to social media use. And our central question is whether social media use is reducing marginalisation and inequality and enhancing economic and social inclusion for youth, or do we see its use being mapped onto perhaps reinscribing existing socio-spatial inequalities? And I should just say before any of the fieldwork was undertaken that we had ethical clearance by Durham University and the National Commission for Science and Technology um, in Malawi. Um, so how do we go about uh, thinking about um, understanding digital divides and accessing and using social media in Malawi? Well, for anybody, and particularly for um, young people in Africa, to engage with social media, there are a number of pretty obvious prerequisites. Firstly, uh, one needs to have hardware. Um, uh, infrastructure essential for access. If you haven't got a working device, mostly a smartphone, if you haven't got network coverage, if you haven't got sufficient network signal, access to electricity, whether it's solar power or mains electricity. If you can't charge your device or if you don't have money to buy data or airtime, then you're going to be on the disadvantaged side of the have-nots of what's been called the material digital divide or the first level digital divide. So that's the left-hand side of this diagram here. Physical access. So given that everyday life is pretty precarious for many people across sub-Saharan Africa, accessing all those things on the left-hand side is a constant effort. Even if you're the most privily wealthiest urban elite, you still struggle to get all those things to work on a given day. On the other side, there's the additional requirement of digital literacy or digital capital to be able to actually use social media, sometimes called the second level digital divide, or the usage gap, or the participation gap. So for this, you need some basic literacy, perhaps to read and write, usually in English or another colonial language. Um, you need knowledge, competency, and confidence to use social media apps. So none of this mosaic, the kind of the right-hand side and the left-hand side of the prerequisites, can be taken for granted. And even if you've got all of those as a given, there's the additional factor of being receptive and willing to embrace social media. Not everybody wants to do that. So as we've argued earlier in some of these papers that we've already published from this project, digital capital can have several dimensions and it can change over time for individuals. So lack of digital capital can be perpetuated by and feed into lack of other forms of capital. So for example, if you're not very wealthy, you don't have much financial capital, or if you're not very well educated, you don't have much um, knowledge capital and so on. So as we examine below, there are lots of reasons why children and young adults in Malawi are not using social media. And our survey showed that um, across the three countries, only 16% of the 4,500 respondents aged 9 to 24 years were um, using internet-based social networking, only 16%. So it's worth looking more closely at those people who aren't using it, people on the disadvantaged side of this particular digital divide, because at the time we did the survey in 2013-14, they were actually the majority. So we conduct then this closer scrutiny by interrogating the data from Malawi, where in fact only one in 10 young people surveyed reported using social media sites on a mobile phone. So these are some of the headline uh, results from our survey. So uh, we conducted our survey in 2013-14, and only 3% or less of the 1,500 children and young people lived in a household with a computer, but two-thirds 60% of their households had a mobile phone, although there were a lot of geographical differences. Many, many urban households, almost all of them, 92%, had a mobile phone, but in remote rural settlements, only about a third, only 32% did. For young people themselves, individually owning a mobile phone is something that's cross-cut by gender, by age, by geography. So the people who are most likely among the young people to have a mobile phone live in urban areas, that's 36%, are older in the 19 to 25 year old age bracket, that's one third of them, 29%, more likely to be male, 
lowest figures for girls, only 14%, <coughs> living in a rural area, only 7%, and the younger children in the 8 to 13 age group, only 0.5% of them had a mobile phone. And you can see this in table one, although you probably can't read the numbers from sitting at the back. I did try to make them bigger, apologise for that. Um, now, our survey was conducted in 2013-14, and I realise we're sitting here in 2018. Time has moved on, and we can safely surmise that mobile phone ownership continues to rise. And indeed, from a recent survey in 2016 in a village in southern Malawi, as part of this um, current research that I'm doing on cash transfers, we found only a third of households had a mobile phone. So it is continuing, but it's definitely not universal, it's not ubiquitous. So it's too soon to share the kind of triumphant claims that some people are making that the mobile phone has conquered all rural areas of Africa. But even the authors making that claim acknowledge that there is poor network coverage in rural areas. Um, so if we go um, back a slide here. Overall then, about three quarters, 73% of our young survey participants had actually used a cell phone in the past year and 58% of them in the last four weeks. But as many as nearly one in four, that's 24%, had never used a cell phone. So for those who had used a cell phone though in the previous 12 months, only 10% of them said they'd used social network sites on a mobile phone. But of those 157 young people who we're calling social media users, 99% of them had used Facebook in the last four weeks and only 21% used the popular messaging app WhatsApp. So at that time, Facebook was social media. Now WhatsApp has become much more popular because it's cheaper as well. And we know that anecdotally, but we have data from a point in time from a survey. So our survey is showing that young people who do not use social networks on a cell phone live in all kinds of locations, those who are using social networking are most likely to be in urban areas and peri-urban areas. However, in the rural and remote rural areas, use is pretty, pretty negligible. It's uh, less than 1%. And this came up in our interviews, and this was a dominant refrain about never having used social media, especially in remoter uh, rural um, locales. So young farmers um, in their 20s saying, I've never used social media, I've never used the internet or Facebook. Um, and this was also the same in urban areas. We had some urban young people saying this as well, even if they had used, used a mobile phone. So we've got uh, people who've never used, we've got people who are inactive users. So I have a Facebook account, but I rarely access it. We've got active users. I've got a Facebook account, I've got about 20 contacts. We've got a range of users. What about those who are not using social media? Why? So we found a variety of reasons why many young children, uh, children and young people in Malawi don't use social media on a cell phone. Basic level, they don't have the prerequisites, no access to a working phone, don't own one, that may be due to poverty, it may also be to do with age. In lots of families, children are not considered old enough to have a mobile phone or they're not allowed to by parents or school rules, they can't have a phone whilst they're still in formal education. This was quite a common refrain. Although going to boarding school and going to secondary school is often a point of transition where this is seen at a time when it's acceptable or even necessary to have a mobile phone, but schools vary on their rules. Others may own a mobile phone, but only a basic one that doesn't have capacity for social networking. So uh, my phone doesn't have those facilities. Even without owning a smartphone though, some young people find ingenious ways to create and access social media by sharing handsets, and this is very common. So we've got sisters in this case um, sharing. My younger sister created this Facebook account for me on her phone, and so I use her phone when I want to access it. My phone doesn't support Facebook. Interestingly, in this case, Mary's case, the younger sister is the one who's got the more advanced technology. And this is something that we do find in some of the data that young people are early adopters of new ICT more than old people. And we've got some examples of where young people are teaching older people how to use um, technology and how to use phones. For others though, being illiterate and having poor access to education is a barrier to using social media, even text messaging um, on a phone. So we've got interviewees who said, I have problems with writing text. I'm very slow. I didn't go very far with my education. I'd rather just call and others uh, saying, I've never received a text message, I don't know how to read, I wouldn't be able to understand a text message. So um, if we look at this in terms of our survey data, where we've got information on people's school levels um, and achievements in terms of educa formal education, among those who'd never attended school, there was no reported use of social media, not surprisingly. 
and usage is lowest, just 4% among those who only had some element of primary school education. Whereas for those who went on to secondary school, about uh, over a third of them, 36%, uh, were using social media. And of the few, there weren't many in our 18 to 25 year olds who've gone on to tertiary education, almost all of them, 88% are using social media. So we've got very similar patterns then in this table um, with age and, uh, and education in particular about using social networking and using Facebook and the, the two are more or less the same um, and so on. So it's very similar patterns. So not surprisingly, level of education correlates positively with social media use. And with respect to literacy and language fluency, our observations and only anecdotal evidence here is that young people and older people using social media in Malawi often mix English and Chichewa and other local languages in, in informal ways. So the, the basic requirement is literacy. Um, and then it evolves and there's kind of slang and abbreviations in there as well. But formal schooling alone isn't just a predictor or a guarantor of using social media. Not everyone who's been to school necessarily has all the other prerequisites, the technical competency, the knowledge, the confidence to use social media or the willingness to embrace um, that. So um, we have some more reasons then for not using social media. So in rural areas, for example, there may be people who've got a very high tech latest smartphone and this might be a prestige symbol, a social status symbol. But the owner, even if they've got some schooling, may lack ability to use its smartphone features. So we've, we've got that kind of quotation. Yes, I have the most sophisticated cell phone in the village. Most people admire me, but I don't use it. I don't know how to use the internet. Similarly, Mary in an urban area has a smartphone. She can't use it for social media either. It has the internet, but it lacks the settings. It doesn't work properly. Um, even those who went as far as secondary school, they still, in rural areas, have low awareness of social media. I don't really know about social networks. I've just heard about Facebook. I don't know much about it. So there are these have-nots then who aren't using social media, perhaps because they're socially uh, or spatially marginalised. But there are also some young people who are taking a more active stance and consciously choosing and declaring not using social media because they see it as a negative thing. It's a time waster. It's immoral. It's not an activity that I want to be involved with. I think it keeps people busy waiting, wasting their time. It's all about gossip. It's all about talking about sex. This doesn't interest me. I don't want to be part of this. Um, so that's a different kind of approach. So rejection then, or as expressed and enacted by these young men in this case, is always a possible response to a new technology. We shouldn't just assume that because the technology is there, people will use it and embrace it. However, within Malawi, our research revealed a range of usage levels among the minority of young people who do actively use social media. And our survey revealed Facebook is the most popular social media platform, um, although we think that's changing. Um, the depth of uptake is variable. Some people very rarely active on Facebook, others are much more active. But the general pattern is that the active Facebook users tend to be male, urban, older, and more educated. Okay. So, um, Thinking about social media use, then, for those small minority of young people who are using it, is it transforming social relations? That's something we wanted to investigate. So there were several outcomes that were being reported as perceived to be beneficial in using social media. So enhanced social relations locally, regionally, globally, through the networking that has been enabled through their digital connections through the mobile phone. So one way to measure this in the survey was we asked the children and young people who were using social networks on a cell phone, we asked them how many contacts they have on their cell phone or on their SIM cards, because they might have multiple cell phones and SIM cards and the two are not necessarily the same thing. And we had a range of answers across uh, people just having one single contact to as many as 1,700 contacts. The median number, not surprisingly, follows the same pattern of social media use. Um, you can't see much of the detail here, but the people who got the highest number of contacts were urban, tertiary educated, and men, young men. Girls, those living in rural areas and those with less education, had fewer contacts than male urban dwellers and those with higher education levels. If we look a bit further, we look in urban and peri-urban sites in Malawi, the girls were less likely to be using social media overall than the boys and young men, 
But out of those who were using social media, in this case Facebook mostly, the girls had a higher median number of contacts than the boys and were more likely to have contacts in other countries, especially Europe and North America. We think this is potentially an important finding. It suggests that the gendered social media divide is not as straightforward as it might at first appear. And it's different across Ghana and South Africa, but this paper is only focusing um, on Malawi. So being connected on social media can occasionally, or lead to other material benefits, including access to jobs and livelihood opportunities. That's one um, thing that came out. So this is one of our uh, research assistants. I've more than six friends who got jobs via Facebook on their phones, and I've been invited to many interviews through the phone. So clearly, it can bring about material benefits. At the more mundane, everyday level, social media usage seems to enhance local social relations, as in the case of Maria, who's married and lives in a peri-urban settlement where she's a subsistence farmer and her husband works nearby in the capital city. Maria has two phones to make use of both major cell phone networks in Malawi. On one phone she's got 70 contacts on a SIM card and 100 contacts on the other. And she recounts here how her local friendship um, networks are enhanced by using social media. I'm on Facebook, I've got 10 friends on Facebook, they're all women, they all live locally. I interacted last with a female friend who stays nearby, we were inviting each other for dinner, we were chatting about food, we spent 20 minutes, I see this person nearly every day. So in this case, Facebook is being used not as a tool to overcome the tyrannies of distance, nationally or transnationally, but women like Maria, who live just a few houses from each other, but they're tied by domestic responsibilities, uh, have to be the household anchor for childcare, for food preparation, but they can connect with social media to chat with friends and neighbours nearby, everyday matters like meal preparation, getting together to share um, dinner and so on. So that's a kind of example of local um, social relations being enhanced. Beyond sustaining local friendship groups, social media use has been widely lauded for its capacity for maintaining social relations across distance. Now, in the Malawian context, for decades, Malawians have migrated beyond the country's borders to work, especially to South Africa. And this trend continues today. So many participants in our research have relatives who are currently in South Africa, and some of the older participants had spent time working there in the past. And many young people aspire to opportunities to go and work in this more affluent country. They just need to get a passport and get the fare for the bus ride, and then there'll be a relative, a friend, who, who will get them into employment opportunities and they'll have money to send home. So superseding letter writing and phone calls, which previously were the dominant means of long distance communication, now it's social media usage, especially Facebook, is the most cost effective and the most timely way to keep in touch with fellow Malawians in South Africa. And now I would add WhatsApp, because WhatsApp is cheaper. So Mpatso then, um, who dropped out of primary school and works as a minibus conductor, explains how he uses social media on his dual SIM phone, and the latest phone that of several that he's owned. He uses this to connect with his friend from his home village who's gone to South Africa. And he explains how he does that um, through Facebook and how he chats with, with them. And then even uh, new users of social media like Chimwemwe, who's also in her 20s, they're keen to grasp the opportunities offered by social networking to maintain social relations with individuals who are abroad in the Malawian diaspora, not just in South Africa, but, but beyond. So then social media use seems to have been uh, embraced enthusiastically by these young Malawians as a way to enlarge their social networks, although sometimes quite uncritically, as these kind of extracts show. Um, people have got lots of friends on, on Facebook. Um, I've never rejected any request. I accept anybody who wants to be my friend on Facebook. Some of them are girls. Sometimes I request to befriend them because they look beautiful. I haven't met them face to face. Um, my sister knows my password, she logs on to Facebook my account and she told me I have 300 friend requests. When I log on I will accept them all regardless of who they are, whether I know them personally or not. Now this approach of accepting all social media contact requests from strangers we found quite common in the accounts given to us by young people when we talked to them about using social media in Malawi. Now, as researchers from the Global North, this starts to ring alarm bells and it contravenes the behavioural norms and the social codes of conduct that we emphasise to young people elsewhere, particularly in the affluent West, about staying safe online. Clearly, no such messages being perpetuated through Malawian schools um, in, in, in this context. Um, 
Only about a tenth of the young people we surveyed were actually using social media, but many of the non-users aspired to do so, and namely they wanted to get onto Facebook. So currently I don't have a Facebook account, I've never had one, but I hope soon I will have mine, and then I will hear about news happening in other places and I will make friends with people from other countries. So these were the kind of reasons given by children and young people wanting to use social media to enlarge their social networks, to develop relationships online with people beyond Malawi's borders and get information from elsewhere, getting news updates from the phone. Locally or internationally, I can use Google and Facebook. So social networking then also has a reputation for being a source of information of things happening elsewhere and for establishing new relationships in wider circles with the hope of some possible eventual gain, whether friendship, romance, travel, education, employment or other material benefit. So all well and good, lots of positives here, but there are some negatives too and some warnings so as well as these potential benefits then afforded by social media usage that we've looked at, there are some potentially negative aspects that came out in our research. Firstly, simply having a smartphone with social media capability can make young people a target for thieves because such phones are expensive and they're easily stolen, they're easily resold. So one teenage boy in a focus group said, with WhatsApp, Facebook, many people want my phone, so my parents warn me not to stay out late. Um, secondly, it can also be a source of unwanted sexual harassment, whether from strangers or acquaintances um, via social media. And this is quite common and this was accounted here. Um, at first we were discussing normal, pe normal things. I spent almost two hours online on my sister's phone, but then he started to propose to me, so making romantic overtures. We did um, find only little evidence, though, of this kind of online harassment and cyberbullying. There wasn't that much um, of it. Although some people said they didn't want to use social media because they thought that this kind of um, immoral activity was going on, as, as, as they called it. More likely, people saw it as a time waster. And so Brian is a busy secondary school student. He has his own barber shop, phone charging, electronic selling, repair business. He minimises his use of social media. He says it's a time waster. Other school girls in focus groups said Facebook was a time waster and had poor educational outcomes for children and caused intergenerational conflict. Some young people, they said, spend most of their time on their cell phones, playing games and chatting on Facebook instead of studying. When their parents advise, the, advise them to concentrate on studying, they don't listen, they even say bad things about their parents. Similarly, in our women's focus groups, mothers and grandmothers also saw social media as a source of conflict with younger generations, and their complaint was it diverts children from contributing to household chores, particularly girls. My daughter is always on internet, Facebook and WhatsApp. She doesn't do the work I assign to her on a daily basis. She does not respect me. My children do not concentrate on household chores. They're always busy with the phone, Facebook and WhatsApp. And it wasn't just the mothers and the grandmothers that were saying this, but the young women were saying it too. So, um, saying most parents fail to get their children to do household chores because the youth spend most of their time on Facebook. For example, my younger sister disrespected my mother because whenever my mother gave her some tasks to do, she took almost one hour before she started to do that task because she's always on Facebook. So this time wasting then is identified by parents, it's identified by young people, and it's not a new observation, and this is not restricted to Malawi. So uh, Miller, in his seminal anthropological study of Facebook in Trinidad, describes Facebook as a time suck and teenagers as the heaviest users. So there were quite a few debates in our interviews and focus groups about social networking, particularly as a distraction from schoolwork. Um, through Facebook, they're busy sending one another pictures instead of concentrating on their studies. It affects their studies. And we've seen these debates in the print media in Malawi as well, teachers being interviewed and saying that cell phones should be banned and could continue to be banned in school because otherwise there'll be chaotic scenes in class, students would not concentrate on their lessons, they would be busy on their smartphones on WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, they would put their effort into downloading videos on YouTube, it just can't work, we need to keep cell phones out of school. More seriously though, antisocial use of social media is for criminal activities and this wasn't directly reported in our study um, but what was reported was creating and circulating obscene images and video and this was frequently identified as very common. Uh, lots of people say I logged into Facebook and I saw two naked girls. Um, social media is re reported as a tool for circulating indecent material, whether people are related, whether they're connected on Facebook as so-called friends or also strangers and there were a lot of accounts of that. So my cousin has a girlfriend who lives in South Africa. The girlfriend likes taking pictures of her own nudity and sent to my cousin via WhatsApp. I see these a lot. 
Last year, a boy and a girl went to such and such a place. While they were there, they started having sex. A stranger who was passing by started recording them, them and posted the sex clip on Facebook and WhatsApp. A lot of people saw that clip and some were able to recognize them. So we have then an ease and a frequency with which what we might describe as pornography is being propagated through social media. And this is another reason why some young people say, I'm unwilling to get involved with this technology. So Ruth says, I'm not on any social network. My phone can access the internet. I know it's possible to access social network. I'm just not interested. What put me off is what people say about sending each other new pictures or pornographic materials through social network. I don't have an example. I just hear that people do that and I'm not interested. So we didn't have quantitative data about the pornography and the decent images. It was all in our focus groups and the qualitative discussion. But there is a survey done in Nigeria on Christian students at university, and that found that most of the university, 90%, had a mobile phone, and nearly half of them admitted to watching pornography on it. Now, we know Nigeria is a very different country to Malawi, but I think we can say that this is a frequent um, occurrence and that pornography on mobile phones is quite commonplace. And it certainly was described so in our interviews and focus groups. So I'd like to draw some um, loose conclusions here then. So we know we're witnessing this rapid adoption of mobile phones and smartphones across Africa and other parts of the global south. I think we should be wary of some of the hype and the euphoria around the claims that these information and social media revolutions are taking place that are taking place across the poorer regions of the world because what we see through the data here is that there's complex social spatial digital divides going on. It is an innovative technology, but it's not reaching everybody. It's not being embraced by everyone everywhere to the same degree. There is a young generation of social media media users emerging in sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere and this is a current era with remarkable speed in technological change but we should also take the long view and we should heed calls to remember that once all media and new technologies were new and exciting and that includes writing, postal delivery, fixed line telephones, computing and all these new technologies that once were new had variable impacts on how we and how Africans communicate so there's no doubt that the take-up of the smartphone with its particular innovative social media capabilities is reshaping the complexities of identities and social relations for young people in sub-Saharan Africa today. But it's important to look beyond the kind of hyperbole and the kind of big claims and look for a more complex, the more nuanced account of how social media has been accessed or not being accessed, how it's been embraced or rejected by young people in Malawi and other countries. So some of the positives of social media use that we've identified in this paper include access to information, new economic opportunities, feeding and meeting aspirations for mobility, enriching young lives, widening social relations in transformative ways. That's great. On the darker side, though, there are negatives too, associated with the ways in which the technology and its use intersects, in particular with children's vulnerability as minors, giving scope for exploitation and deprivation that reflect and reinforce accesses of inequalities, at the same time facilitating and possibly encouraging risky social behaviour. So we see social media then has been appropriated by children and young people in different ways and not always the ways that were intended or desired by governments, by those who license uh, cell phone providers, by cell phone service providers, by those who manufacture the device, by parents, by guardians, by elders and so on. And this is part of what Horst and Miller describe as communicative ecologies in which the use and impacts of technology are neither entirely socially nor technologically deterministic. Others have suggested that social media applications like Facebook can be a simple tool for closing some aspects of the digital divide and encouraging greater social and digital inclusion because it's popular, it's user friendly, it's cheap, it's more or less free, it can be used in many languages. Others, like Professor Mark Graham, who sits in this institute, but I don't believe is here in the seminar today, recognises that while ICTs can stimulate positive economic and social change, but being on the wrong side of the digital divide can be a form of social exclusion, reinforcing pre-existing socio-economic and political structures of power. However, our main argument in this paper is that still many young people, possibly the majority of the world's population, even among the supposed generation of digital natives, are on the wrong side of the digital divide. They don't, won't, can't access social media and other modern digital technologies in any form due to their geographic, socio-economic, technological positionality. 
So we argue for a cautious and critical approach, recognising that new ICTs, including social media, are at best technological tools enmeshed in a highly uneven social spatial fabric. And I would like to thank um, the funders of this research, the ESRC uh, DFID um, anti-poverty um, funding stream that funded us, um, the different universities that were involved in this particular study, Durham University and the University of Malawi, all the children and the other participants. We have published many papers, uh, a few of them are brought along today, and I'd be happy to have discussion and questions. Thank you for listening. So we now have approximately 30 minutes for discussion, questions and answers, so um, please just raise your hand if you'd like to share a question or a comment. Do you want to take over? Uh, yeah, I don't mind. Yeah, so let's start with the Malawian in the room. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Chimwemwe. Chimwemwe. Yeah.